Hey everyone, thanks for being a part of these devotional thoughts. We're actually in Colossians, and so if you'd like to hunt down your Bible, you can open it up to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we'll be at. As you're turning there, several things I wanted to pass on to you. First of all, it's Vacation Bible School Week, and it is going well, and I'm just so grateful, so grateful for all the wonderful volunteers that allows this to happen. That's the scene behind me is VBS, it's Mystery Island, and these students are learning all about how to track down God, how to pursue after God. And we're learning about the attributes of who God is, and, and so it's been very beneficial. And so once again, thank you for everyone that's been a part of that, and really for Matt for heading all this up, and it has been good. Um, also, I wanted to let you know, and it's really exciting news that I get to share with you, on July the 7th, that is a Wednesday, the first Wednesday in July, July 7th, we are actually going to meet back here at church for these Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm excited about that. We'll continue to share more with you of what that will look like, but 6.30 here at the church, Wednesday night on July the 7th. Come be a part of that. We will be looking into God's Word, studying it together, having good dialogue and discussion. And so I think many of you have been longing for that, and I think it's definitely time for us to start this back. And so we are excited to announce that. Just wanted to share that with you July 7th, all right? And then one other thing, I just ask that you would pray for me this week. I'm off to the Grand Canyon. I actually leave tomorrow on Thursday and a long trip to Flagstaff and then all the way around to the North Rim, and and it'll be an enjoyable time. I think it'll be a very challenging time, but uh, I am looking forward to that. And so anyways, just wanted to share those thoughts with you. Well, tonight, tonight we're going to look here, and what Paul's going to do in chapter one at the end of this is really talk about himself and really the purpose that God gave to Paul. Now, through our journey thus far through chapter 1, what we've seen is uh, really kind of this introduction and this pattern of prayer which we could follow from Paul's life. And then he begins to talk about the person and the work of Christ and how Christ is supreme. He is superior over everything. And then he comes here and he ends this chapter and I think that we can begin to follow the example of Paul. Just how we followed his prayer pattern at the beginning of chapter 1. Here we can follow his actions and really the calling in his life. And so this is what Paul is going to do. Now remember and recall that Paul is writing from prison. He is suffering persecution, not just him as well, but also the church they are suffering persecution. And so this is what he says. So if you would follow along with me and maybe we can pull some examples from the life of Paul and really apply it within our life. And so look with me in verse 24 of Colossians chapter one. So chapter one, verse 24, this is what it says. It says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you. Fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now we read this and we begin to ask the question, what example can we take from this, from Paul's life that we can apply to our life? And I start to think, well, we must be willing to pay the price. Look at what Paul says here. He says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you. Now, he's suffering for them. He's never met them. He's not, he didn't start this church. He didn't plant this church. He's never visited this church. But he writes to them and he says, I'm rejoicing for the fact that I get to suffer for you. And he uses that term in a very broad sense. He's suffering for the cause of Christ. He's suffering for the gospel and to proclaim this message to the church. And so Paul is suffering. He's in prison as he writes this. But he makes this statement that seems really strange when we first read this. 
Look with me again in verse 24. It says, I, I, know, uh, I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What is lacking in the affliction of Christ. And when you read that, you, you say, is Paul saying that the cross of Christ wasn't enough, that it, it was lacking something? And clearly, very quickly, do we see that that's not the case? Paul, if you read all his other epistles, you will, you will quickly find that, no, 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 the cross is enough. It satisfies everything, and the cross is our only hope. And so it's not that Paul's saying, I'm suffering, and what I'm doing is actually helping what was lacking with Christ and his suffering. He lacked something, the cross was lacking something, and I'm now filling that void. It's not what he means by this statement. It reads that way, but that is not what it means. Let me read it to us again. Verse 24, I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now here's, here's what we know. And it ends, verse 24 simply says, for the sake of his body, which is the church. And his premise is simply this. Just how Christ suffered, he will continue to suffer through his body, which is the church. And so, if you can recall, when God called Paul to a ministry, he was on the Damascus Road, the light was shining, and he was he was blinded by that. But if you can recall, Christ says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? That's what Jesus says. And actually what Paul was doing, he was persecuting the church. And so that connection, when, we, when people are persecuting the church, they're persecuting Christ. They, he makes that connection because uh, we are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And so at the end of verse 24, he lets us know for the sake of the body, which is the church, the church. And so Paul's premise is simply to say that Christ continues to suffer beyond the cross because his church is suffering. So when he says lacking in the afflictions of Christ, it doesn't mean that uh, the cross wasn't enough. No, the, the cross is enough. It is the very thing that brings salvation, the suffering of Christ. But he continues to suffer because of the church, the body is suffering. And so that's what he says here in the text. And so he goes on in verse 25 through verse 28, and he gives us a sense of purpose. So the first thing that I want us to learn from Paul is that we have to be willing to pay the price. Paul says, I'm suffering and the church is suffering, and we're in this together. And I, I hope, I hope that we are willing to suffer. Now I'm not a prophet, but I, I think it's clear we can see where things are heading for us as a country, and how people really reject and despise the things of God. There will be a day that it will cost us something to say that we believe in Jesus and that we follow him. And I, I, I'm here to just push this into our face to say, are you willing to pay the price? May we follow Paul's example. It says, Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing that I get to suffer for you and to suffer for Christ and to suffer for his church. And I, I want that. I, I, I want to be so secure in my faith, steadfast, that no matter what the cost is, I'm willing to pay the price. So that's the first thing that we see that we can follow Paul's example and to live out. Things will change. Uh, and I, I believe it will change quickly. And there will be a day that uh, people will despise you because you go to church because you believe in Jesus and you have to be willing to stand on Christ. And so that's the first premise. The second thing, like I said, is in verse 25 down through verse 28, and it is that of purpose. We have to be willing to follow the purpose of Christ. This is what Paul and his example to us will say. Look with me in very quickly in verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship 
from God, which was given to me to you to fulfill the word of God. He says, I have become a minister to fulfill the the, the word of God. And so he's saying, I have a purpose. God has given me a purpose. Now, he defines the purpose for us in verse 26. It says, the mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known uh, what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, so Paul says, here's my purpose. I was called to be a minister and to reveal a mystery. Now, we are not called to re reveal a mystery. It's, it's clear that the mystery is revealed in his word to us now. So we're just to proclaim it. But for Paul, he says, look, this whole thing was to the Gentiles as well. And that is the, the calling and the purpose that God puts in Paul's life. He says, this thing was hidden to past generations, but it has been revealed to Paul to proclaim to the Gentiles this mystery. And he lets us know it's simply this, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery that has been revealed to Gentile, non-Jewish people. And, and so this was Paul's purpose. It's not necessarily our purpose, but it is the purpose to um, proclaim God's word. Now that proclamation, this is we're so we're asking the question, what example can I follow uh, from, from Paul? And Paul was dedicated to his purpose. God gave him a purpose. Same is true in our life. Now he ends this in verse 27, giving us two principles to that purpose. Paul says, I'm going to reveal the mystery to that of the Gentiles. And then he comes into verse 27. To them, God willed to make known uh, what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, verse 28, here is what he says. Him we preach. So him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So I'm preaching the mystery, and here's what I'm going to do in verse 28. He says, I'm going to warn everyone. There's a warning here. And the warning is clear. Without Christ, you are without hope. And ultimately, you will die and spend all of eternity in hell. That's the warning that we are to proclaim to all men. And then he goes on, and he says, not just a warning, but to teach, teaching every man in all wisdom. So Paul says, I'm revealing the mystery in two ways. I'm warning them and I'm teaching them all the wisdom that God has given to him. So when we're looking at this purpose for Paul, Paul has a purpose and it is to proclaim the mystery, to proclaim God's plan and hope to give a warning and to teach the truth. Well, church, I hope that you know that we can follow Paul's example and to find purpose in Christ. I think oftentimes people are wandering around this life without purpose. And if you attach yourself to Jesus, he will give you a job to do. We have a mission. We have a purpose. Our job isn't to just sit on our hands and wait till we die. That's not it at all. And so we should be proactive in going out and reaching our neighbors and our nations for the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope that we're willing to do so. So we're asking the, ourselves the question, what examples can we learn from Paul? Well, first of all, we must be willing to pay the price, to suffer well. Secondly, he lets us know that we can find purpose in Christ. And I want to fulfill the, the purpose and the calling that God has given into my life. The third thing that we can see in the text that we can follow Paul's example, and I'll wrap all this up. I'm just kind of rambling now, but look with me in verse 29, last verse of chapter one. It says this, to this end, I also labor striving according, according to his working, which works in me mightily. So he says, I'm laboring, I'm striving, and I'm doing this work 
So he's using labor and work and striving. He's letting us know that all this is actually difficult. It takes effort. If you're going to pay the price and if you're going to fulfill the purpose of God in your life, it's going to take effort, labor and work and striving. But he lets us know which works in me mightily. Simply to say that God is the one that gives him the strength to fulfill his purpose and to pay the price. And so I want us to know that we don't have to do this on our own. God is working within us mightily good things that gives us strength and guidance and wisdom. He gives us the spirit of discernment. He gives us what we need to fulfill his purpose and to count the cost and to pay the price. So that wraps up chapter one. And I hope that you just kind of read through verses 24 down through verse 29 understand what Paul is saying to us. But I I hope and pray that we can follow Paul's example. And as we are here at Vacation Bible School, I, I hope that we can focus in on the attributes of God. And that's what these students are learning this week. And so thanks for tuning in and being a part of this. Let's close with a time of prayer. If you would bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, help me. Help me to understand the cost. Help me to be willing to pay the price. Also, Lord, I ask that you give me a clear purpose. So that is, that is my prayer that we find in your word this evening. Father, help us to be a healthy church. I just pray that you'd bless the VBS celebration that is happening tonight, that you would just allow that to go well. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done for us. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for watching. May you go forth in the power of God's good name. God bless. Thanks.